Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Devika Palin. Today we continue talking about video games with Twitch co-founder Kevin Lin and filmmaker and retired pro gamer Jay Chern. Last episode we focused on what gaming is now, both in Taiwan and internationally. And today we want to focus on where gaming can go from here. Now, for many people, gaming is a hobby for kids or shut-in adolescents. But if you look at the numbers, you might be shocked at how big the industry is. The market is estimated to be worth over $250 billion this year, and it will grow to $300 billion in 2025. Jay, do you play mobile games? I, I, the one I played more, more recently is Pokemon Go. Just <laughs> <laughs> Button pushing. Yes. <laughs> um, as, you, as you've grown older and as a former gamer, is there some? What do you, is there any particular uh, characteristics of a game that you look for now, particularly as you've kind of grown up a little bit? And I think I'm assuming your tastes are a little bit more sophisticated. I don't know if Pokemon Go is more sophisticated, but it's definitely <laughs> more relaxing. So, you know, so, so you're I looking like, for relaxing games now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Kevin, yeah, had a really good point about, I think when I, you know, when I was younger, you know, trying to be like very competitive and, and if I'm playing in a group, of, like if I'm playing on an online server, I, I try to finish, you know, top two or, you know, top five. Now it's just like, okay, if I can last, you know, for maybe like five, 10 minutes and, and not like <laughs> self explode, I think it's pretty good. So I, I, it's definitely a different mentality now as far as how, how to game. And for me personally, yeah, if it's too much stress on, like normally, maybe it's because, you know, I edit and I work in front of a computer a lot of times also. So if it's too difficult on like on the dexterity or yeah, if it's a lot of tapping or high stress, I probably, uh, I'll probably play every once in a while, but definitely not every day. Definitely retired then. Speaking of your filmmaking, like I mentioned before, our guest Jay is not only a former pro gamer, but perhaps more importantly, an acclaimed filmmaker. So we asked him to show us a bit of what video games may look like in the future. Game begin. So is this the virtual background you use while streaming? This is KSP, a popular VTuber, the term for a virtual streamer in Taiwan. Most VTubers through their virtual avatar choose to separate their online and offline identity. But some, like KSP, just don't want to reveal their face and feel more comfortable interacting through their chosen avatar. This is So Bad Rush, a retired pro gamer who now works for Twitch, the undisputed champion of video game streaming. YouTube 這類的,就是從獨立作品到合作遊戲,單人雙人恐怖遊戲會玩,射擊遊戲動作遊戲,玩的蠻多的。目前最常玩的是Apex Legends,就之前有玩那個Apex是有跟觀眾一起玩,但我比較少會跟觀眾玩遊戲。This is Maso, a game producer at Meta Theory in Taipei, developing a new Web3 game called Dust Breakers. Dust Breakers Twilight Shift empowers players to have ownership over their own characters and items. The new game is also experimenting with players' actions, changing the outcome of the overarching story and narrative, making it unique to each and every player. Meta Theory is also developing fun new tech for virtual streaming using iPhones and iPads to capture a streamer's movements and facial expressions. 
的的建议。我自己是觉得，不要去太在意那个数字，数字很重要，钱也很重要，但是我觉得自己做的开心比较重要，因为当你不开心的时候，这些东西都不会有，<笑>这些东西很难很难看得到。你会得到你想要的，我觉得就是放宽心，就是做你自己想做的事情。这个这个是用爱发电的，然后不要去得失心太重吧。我自己是这样想的。Kevin, some of those elements there may look familiar to you.、Um, why do you think you need the metaverse, and why are you going in this direction? Doesn't current technology already cover most of most of what we've seen there? Yeah, I mean, you said metaverse. Metaverse is a, a confusing term.、Um, I think for us, you know, some of the tech you saw there, the VTuber tech that, that Jay highlighted through KSP,、um, that's、uh, I like it. I, lo I I love the potential of that space. So. If you look back at Twitch,、um, uh, it is generally you have to stream yourself, which means you are a public persona as your human flesh body.、Um, the, the VTuber, you could be anybody.、Um, you could use um, um, voice modulation technology to disguise yourself and, and still do the thing that you love.、Um, as KSP said, you can stream whatever you want. You know, playing games, cooking, whatever the case may be, and and sort of obfuscate yourself、um, and 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 remain privacy have have that's a big issue these days、um, where social media has taken us um, um, and the information available online. You know, privacy is the, the utmost important、uh, in, in, in importance in my opinion.、Um, so I, I like that technology.、Um, is that metaverse tech? I don't know. It's just it's whatever, right? It's costume. It's it's cosplay. It's like Halloween every day.、Um, and so I think. That that is one version of where all this all this goes. What people loosely call the metaverse, the digital hangout place. I mean, that already exists. We spend six hours, six and a half hours a day as humanity, on the internet every single day. The average human does this. That's eight hours sleep, eight hours work, you know, an hour and a half with your family, I suppose, and then about six and a half hours a day engaged with your phone for the most part, and and that is broken up into online video about twenty percent. Gaming about thirty、um, uh, percent, and then you know maybe some TV and and, and film through Netflix,、um, and then social media,、uh, and then maybe, God forbid, some reading, you know.、Um, <laughs> so I think that is that is where we are as a species, and what do we do about it? What do we do? Do we go further in? Is that what we need? I don't know.、Um, or do we zoom out a little bit、um, and slow down?、Uh, I think I think that all these industries,、um, you know, are. Traditionally, now very obsessed with engagement. That is the number one metric, and that's largely due to how we are monetized. That that will hopefully change with blockchain. I think that is the hopeful side of when people say metaverse. There's a different commercialization effort towards it, so that it's not so much about spending as much time as possible inside of whatever the thing is. Call it metaverse. Call it a video game. Call it something else. Social media.、Um, Uh, is that you do it deliberately, and that you're there because it's awesome, and you're you're not there wasting time. That's the hope, I think, of of this larger movement we call Web three.、Um, that is the, the the version of the internet we would be proud to be a part of,、um, and be proud to be building in,、um, and and proud to have you know people using our stuff. So that's that's the, I think when people say those types of words, metaverse, etc., that's that's what they're referring to. Now, does Facebook want that? No. <laughs> They want all of your time possible, right? They've got to please their advertising partners. So、um, I hope that new people win. Every day is like Halloween, <laughs> so I'm going to take this to you, Jay. Now, <laughs>、um, Sobat called it streaming, called streaming a companionship industry, and I think Kevin kind of touched on that. What is it to you? Yeah, I think streaming. It allows you to be able to share experiences with a larger community, and also allows you to feel part of a community, even when, let's say, you're you're traveling or you're kind of busy, and but every time you know you want to relax, but you know it's kind of like alone time, but at the same time, being able to interact with other people with similar interests. So I feel like that's so important because at the end of the day, we're trying to be, we're trying to find that connective tissue that, you know, inspires us to, you know, do better, to try to develop something or、uh, create a, a new idea. And I feel like、uh, with streaming, 
it's definitely a long format uh, kind of companionship or a long format, you can say entertainment or just sharing. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's really interesting. And, and talking to KSP, having her share her experiences about how she she doesn't she doesn't create a persona and kind of make up things uh, for that persona because some VTubers do that. They create like they, they'll play that cosplay character and then they'll have a voice, they'll have a backstory, and then everything they reply with or interact with the fans it is is for that character. But for her, it's really just about she's a little bit shy. You know, she didn't want to show her face, but she's really happy to share her experiences, whether it's about her work, her family, her love life, and all those things she shares with her fans. But she just doesn't want to have to reveal her face. And that, that gives even more freedom for people who maybe are more introverted but uh, want to try to connect with more people. And I, I feel like that was, that was a really interesting uh, perspective that I, I haven't seen before. Kevin. Um Jay used to be a gamer and quite a successful one at one point, and now he's a filmmaker. Do you think he'll make a good streamer? Would he make a successful streamer oh, totally. if you had to? <laughs> totally. I could see you as like some giant mecha bear thing. Uh, no, I think the, 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 thing, the good thing about streaming is it, it really, like all content creation, you try hard enough and you figure out a good good, a good audience pitch. And, and, and with, when it comes to streaming, there's a lot of regularity. Well, I guess that's similar for all, all, all social, so not all, most social media. Um, there's some regularity of which you need to either post content or stream. Um, and there's a lot of you know, expectation setting there too. Um, but yeah, no, totally, Jay, you should bring it back. Get, 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 <laughs> there we go. Next the time CS, we speak to you. <laughs> Right, as we said there, video games sure do promise to bring new exciting experiences and opportunities in the future, but it's not all about expectations and optimism among gamers. So for a more cautious take, we once again turn to our chief gaming officer on the Connected Production team, Thomas, take it away. Hi, I'm Tomas, capital G, you know what, I'm not gonna do the shtick again. There are a lot of things I love about video games. The variety, the inclusivity, the creativity. But there are also things that I hate. Corporate greed, workplace crunch, loot boxes, aka gambling, and predatory microtransactions. It is this last thing that comes to mind whenever I think about video games and the metaverse, NFTs, and Web3. Many of us already feel that a lot of games feel designed to funnel players into in-game stores. In fact, some seem designed exclusively for that purpose. My question for the panelists is, how do we make sure that the metaverse, Web3, and NFT applications in video games are not just another way for developers to fence off increasingly minute portions of the game and sell them to us piecemeal? I think that was meant for you again, Kevin. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something I think about constantly. Um, it's, it's purely philosophical, unfortunately. Um, the reality is gaming is such a large industry that you will not be able to shift it. It's, it's working. That, that, that model you described of microtransactions, this free-to-play model that, again, emerged largely from Korea. Korea really did perfect it, and then it was embraced by the mobile games industry um, to a T where you know people go poor playing games, sadly. <clears throat> and um, that is that is that is not something we want to do. There's a lot of folks that we know in the industry who would you know, refuse to do that. Um, but they do want to test the free-to-play model. Uh, the free-to-play model means the game is free. Um, there are many versions of this. There are versions that force you into these transactions that uh, you hit these gates in the game where you can no longer play. Or it, it becomes less fun. It becomes hard, let's say. Um, and so you're encouraged to either continue to grind for hours and hours to get past it, or you just go, you know, hit this simple button, get pay a dollar, and now you can beat this level. Like that's essentially kind of how it works, um, sort of like normal life in a way. Um, but it is abusive. It can be abusive. And so there are game studios out there. I'll, I'll pick. I'll pick on Blizzard um, as a positive version of this, where when they were making Hearthstone. You know, they consciously decided, like, okay, let's let's kind of limit this. Let's not make it so people can spend tens of thousands of dollars in this game. Let's make it so it's maybe you know a couple hundred bucks if you really want to. And there's actually no real reason to spend the money except for cosmetics. Uh, Fortnite is the same way. Um, it's a free game. The whole game is free. You buy cosmetics um, at your choice. 
Yes, it can run away. Could you spend thousands of dollars on cosmetics? Sure. But it's not likely because it's not tricking you into buying it. It's just marketing to you, just as you might buy, buy a new Air Jordan or a new watch. Um, it's, it's the same idea. It's just cosmetic. There's no gameplay effect of what they sell you. And that is a more fair mechanism. And so there's movements, multiple movements in the games industry. There are people who are there with, you know, they, they have one thing in mind. It's margin and growth and, and profit. Um, and there are people who are on both sides. Of course, you have to make money to survive as a video game company. And so it's deciding what is a fair business model. Um, and then there's the old school premium, which is still around. You know, people still sell games for 60 bucks on Steam. Of course, they want to continue to transact, so they might sell you additional stuff, what they call DLC, downloadable content over time, um, but uh, which is a relatively fair model. What, what people don't like, you know, after free to play came out, the criticism on premium was basically, oh, they're making me pay 60 bucks and it might be a crappy game. Um, and so free to play, I like because I can jump in, I can decide for myself if I want to support the, the game developer, I can just buy stuff off the store. Um, but there's, you know, both ends because game making is incredibly expensive. Um, games like Call of Duty cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make every single year, just like a, just like a, you know, a big, a big CG film would. Um, and so it's, it's expensive um, and it's risky. And so you'll see a lot of these models continue to exist. I think in Web3, unfortunately, a lot of the, a lot of the starter models were, I wouldn't say by design, abusive necessarily. Um, it was all very experimental, um, but you had this floating thing called a token, and that's the, a token that traditionally is used in a video game is, is a soft currency. It's not, it's not transferable back to cash. You spend cash to get it, or you grind it, you play the game to get it. You can't extract it out necessarily. Now, there's a whole gray market of people selling that stuff right, on eBay, uh, through Bitcoin, and so on. Um, but per terms of service of the video game, the money that goes in, the time that goes in, that's all trapped inside of the video game. And so the movement of Web3 is twofold. One is, okay, those things you get, those things you buy, the things you earn, they're yours. You can take them as you might take a Pokemon card with you. If you never play Pokemon cards again, Magic cards again, you can at least have them for yourself just for keepsake, or you could sell them um, for some 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 profit or or, or you know, mitigation of loss, let's say. Um, but then there's this token thing that is very, it's a currency, it's designed to be a currency, which most people don't even understand. I, I hardly understand it. Um, and it's fluctuating. And it's, it's, it in itself has its own gamified system of people just trading it, unrelated to the video game. And that caused a lot of harm. A lot of people were, were playing the game, earning these tokens, quitting their jobs to do it. And then the price tanked, and many in most cases, I think in all cases last year, and uh, people people lost, you know, had quit their jobs and then lost their source of income. And again, mo many of those game makers had, had no intentions to do that. They were just experimenting in a space that's very hard to understand, which is crypto. And what would you like to see, Jay, coming out of this as people as these the, the games evolve? And and now you've heard Kevin about the uh, issue of monetizing these games. As someone who is a former gamer, say you were still at the top of your game, still competing. What was it that, that would attract you to stay and keep trying in, in this realm? I think that that's kind of uh, two different uh, sec or two different questions in a sense. I think with competitive gaming, it's definitely about the structure, about uh, if as a competitor you can get support, whether it's getting a monthly salary, if you're good enough to be able to focus and practice and then kind of entertain your fans and audiences. Do you and, have to love but, the game? Oh, definitely. I feel like to to be able to spend 12 hours a day playing a game uh, just for competition that you don't like, uh, you'll definitely burn out really quickly. And I think that was, at least that was my experience even, you know, from high school through college uh, in Counter-Strike in our team of five, or usually we had six people uh, the six percent as a backup. Um, if they weren't passionate about the game, or they weren't passionate about trying to learn new strategies or trying to compete, you would you would really quickly burn out. I mean, it, it'll be fun to be in that environment where, like you saw Gamer be with all the fans cheering you. You'll get to that high, but once you make a misstep and let's say you lose a couple tournaments, and you're also having difficulty kind of seeing your future of how to kind of support yourself playing this game as an eSport, then it, the really quickly that illusion of uh, kind of the grandeur of 
of being like a, a top champion. Once that wears off, it kind of goes away. And as far as like uh, free to play gaming and monetization, I feel like that's definitely something that I didn't have to think about gaming uh, when I was growing up. You know, you, you would buy your game for $50, $60, whether it's, you know, StarCraft or uh, Nintendo. Uh, you know, you, you'd, you'd buy the game and then you would just play it. Uh, but I, I feel like with my experience with uh, Pokemon Go, that's free to play. But then, you know, as you're grinding, you're trying to get like higher levels or you want certain items, uh, certain cosmetics changes, then it kind of baits you into trying to uh, spend more and more money. So I've definitely fallen into that trap. And, and Kevin, to you, you know, China started putting restrictions on gaming. I mean, they, they did they, they, they did a number on the whole industry to begin with, but then also on society saying children should only play so many hours and kind of put, put really hard and fast rules there. Do you, is that something you ascribe to? Do, do you think that's what needs to be done in society so to, to limit the abuse from both uh, the gamer or the game creators and from people who are playing? Um, it's a big question. Uh, I think what we should do is educate people. And, and let them make their own choices. Um, I think there are certain abusive mechanisms in games that are being discussed. Um, what Tomash mentioned in, in the clip about uh, loot boxes is gambling. That is, in, that is in debate across the globe. That's the United States, that's Europe, that's China, that's everywhere. Um, it, is, it is verging on gambling. Again, in theory, you can't withdraw it. But the reality is it's happening. The reality is people do sell each other things in the real world for cash or, or crypto. And so that because I think finally people realize this, um, they're trying to do something about it. Um, so yes, I, I do think there are many things about the industry that could use some rules. Um, uh, ideally, the industry itself is self-regulating, but that's obviously not the case in, in every industry out there. There's always runaway. And so I think what China did is, um, on the outside looking in, feels onerous, feels kind of weird maybe to the Western audience. Um, but when you realize like that is, you have to do both things. You have to work within the industry and then you have to work on the output of the industry and, and figure out how to best treat the consumer. And so when, when something slips past you and becomes abusive, that may be the only thing you can do. Um, but that, that, is, that is actually what, that's actually a problem around the globe, right? People waste money on, on dumb games um, and they're tricked into them, they're trapped. Um, and they get no real value. They get no social value. They they don't really get any story value. They don't get any memory value. There's nothing really interesting coming out of many of these types of games, um, except it's a waste of time. It's a great it's a great way to pass the time, I should say. Um, so how do you regulate it? I don't know, but I do think that you know best bet, and this is the harder thing to do, is to invest in education at the ground up, um, so that when it comes to life decisions around, do I waste five hours in this crappy slot machine style game, um, or do I do something more valuable? That's your choice, really, right? Do you choose, choose to sit around and watch TV all day? Yeah, you, you could do that. That's your choice. Is that something that the rest of society might be like, well, why are you wasting your time? But at the end of the day, if people were just educated better, I think, then they, they can make their own choices and, and, and know that by making the choice that they're doing, what the consequences might be for the rest of their life. Right. Uh, before we go, I just want to ask you, um, I'm not your demographic at all. I, I don't think I am. What would you suggest that I would, I should do or I should start playing or start, start thinking of? Um, if you want to see one of the biggest games in the world and start to understand gamer mentality, um, I, have I guess I have three recommendations. I, I, I would say um, Genshin Impact. I don't know what it's called in Taiwan, uh, but it's a, it's a company called Hoyoverse, MiHoYo. A uh, Chinese company. It's Japanese anime in style. Uh, it looks like Japanese anime, but it's actually a Chinese developer. Um, it is a huge, beautifully designed open world MMO, you know, thing. It's it's kind of many things. It unfortunately has a lot of the monetization mechanisms that um, Tomas mentioned, but it's cool just to see what it's like because that is one of the largest games in the world today. The other game. Um, if you have a computer worth playing is League of Legends. It's a great uh, team-based competitive game to learn. It's still huge. And then um, I guess Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft is, is mobile. Minecraft is an amazing story in the games industry. It was made by one guy. 
um, eventually bought by Microsoft for a, for a, for, a, for a great deal for Microsoft. Um, but it is still one of the largest, most influential games in the world, played by hundreds of millions of people every single month. Um, it's got sort of like how do how do what's a good analogy? It's like Legos in a sense. You 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 get thing you get materials and you build with your friends, um, and people build really elaborate. Like you can see an entire on one server. There's Every single city, actually, I shouldn't say one server, but as an example, you can see all of Manhattan completely rebuilt inside of Minecraft. I am sold. And Jay, what do you suggest? Pokemon Go? Uh, no, don't don't play Pokemon. <laughs> don't follow. It is awesome though. Yes, it at least got people to go outside. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that's that's good. Yeah, I did, I did walk a lot uh, because of Pokemon. Because <laughs> that's a plus. Yeah. You get, I think you can, uh, if you do want to try StarCraft 2, then we can play multiplayer, two against two. Me and Kevin versus you and Tomas. <laughs> All right. Uh, why am I on the losing side? No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to both my guests, Kevin Lin and Jay Chern, for shedding some light on the mega industry that is video games. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to our viewers for your company. Thanks for watching Connected.